Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening and watching, and please hit that like and subscribe button if you want to support the show. So today, before we get into our special guest, let's kick it off with our weekly Patreon question. And this kind of ties into what we were just talking about a little bit. What is or has been your favorite decade? Mm. Hmm. I mean, the 90s were so fun for me. I think the 90s. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to concur. The 90s. Same here. Yeah. One, and I mean, I don't think you could have any more fun than a human being had yeah. when we were in the 2000s, in the beginning part of it. But no, right. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, <laughs> right. The 90s were it. I, I just think everyone yeah. was having a great time. They, they really were. You know what I mean? Everyone was having a great time. And the music was so good. Everything. Music was good. Comedy was good. Cause TV. It, was, it, it didn't have to oh. get censored, right? Yeah. Like, like today, the best comedy, it no longer exists because it might hurt someone's feelings. It doesn't. Yeah. It's one-sided. Yeah. And it's starting to get mean. Right. And, and once that happens, I hope, because comics, man, they're not supposed to be mean. No, oh, man. Not by nature. And so. You're supposed to make fun of every religion. Everybody. everybody every it's, race, we give you permission. Every, yeah. <laughs> As a people, man, yeah. we give our comics yeah. permission to pick yeah. on us. Yeah. What they, year did Kings of Comedy come out? Oh, Can you look that, was that such up? A great Dude, one. I was watching. I think that, that was two thousands, right? Like early. Was 2000s, it early two thousand? Yeah. yeah, when the Kings yeah. came I out. I think that was the funniest. Two thousand five, maybe. When was that just, Bernie Mac? Yes. Cedric the Entertainer. Steve Harvey. Steve, Steve Harvey, Harvey and somebody else. Yeah. It released two thousand. Okay. So late nineties, early two thousand. I think that that is the funniest. Yeah. DL Hughley. Show. DL Hughley. He's a king too. Yeah. He's a king. Yeah. Don't leave him out. I miss Bernie Mac so much. That yeah. man, he helped mentor me. Do you remember him on Friday? Dude, I mean, he was great. That human being, that soul yeah. on this planet, yeah. I miss. Yeah. I still watch, thank God for YouTube sometimes, man. Yeah. That sucker comes in handy. I'll pull Bernie Mac shows up and, yeah. and watch King, The Kings. Yeah. If that sucker's on. Yeah. He, he, he was so tough, beyond his, his. Even know what he's going to say, and it's still funny. Yeah. It's just the way he does it. Uh -huh. It's his delivery. His I delivery. Can, I can yeah. picture him like doing that roll backing up in the oh, big Cedric, Cadillac. Oh, Cedric, man, them oh, guys. Yeah, Cedric, yeah. yeah, those guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, they were that that when they were running around. That's yeah. a proper t uh, title for them. The Kings. They were great. Yeah. I actually think that should be a rite of passage. Everyone has to watch Kings of Comedy at yeah. least once. Kings of Comedy, Pulp Fiction. Friday. There's a few. Okay, so the eighty. We were we were looking up eighty five movies, nineteen eighty five yeah. up until when you went to the nineties. So we had everything in the nineties. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you could watch TV. All, right. You want you just go to the store and blockbuster. Had, yeah. Remember all that blockbuster. blockbuster. It's like, hey, can you check in the bin? It's not on the shelf. Can you check yeah. in the yeah. bin? I know you got in the back. Yeah. I know it's in the back. Yeah. And yeah. then you put your name on the poster. See so uh -huh. if you can get it. Uh huh. Yeah. Check in the bin. What's Who's up? checking in the bin today? No one. <laughs> you just hit a button and you're watching whatever you want. <laughs> that's that's the other problem. It's gotten too easy. Yeah. It is. And we it, earned our movies. We yeah. did earn our movies and we paid late fees. And we paid late fees. <laughs> and if you don't rewind them, if you don't yeah. rewind that VHS. Didn't what were you saying? You said the same the other day. We had this conversation, man. There was a uh, thing on Blockbuster the other day and I said I actually when I was in high school, I had a job after school and I remember one week my entire paycheck and I think I got paid every two weeks, my entire paycheck went to Blockbuster late fees. And I cried. I cried that? for days. But I've not. See, those are the best lessons that's, learned. Man, that's Our how generation, you learn. That's we how learn, you learn lessons differently. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most people have their entire paycheck and they have to pay their car note or whatever. My entire freaking paycheck went to late fees and I was so bummed. Yeah, I think humans act differently when they can just look up the answer. Yeah. Because when, you, <laughs> when you've had to experience the answer, it's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. For How about sure. the constant letdown of Blockbuster? We're like, oh man, we're gonna watch this, and you get there and it's not there. You're like, all right, do you oh, want to watch yeah. this instead? Like, <laughs> who gets let down anymore these days? Yeah. Again, the answers are at right. your fingertips. You can find it all. I remember the smell yeah. walking in there too. Yeah. It was like new movies. You can see that new movie wall. Mm -hmm. Had them all in there. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Good times, man. Yeah, the nineties. Great about generation. You? How did you have much juice? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a specific year that's been my absolute favorite, and it's 2019. Year we won the Natty. Uh, that's whenever I first started traveling a lot solo. Just an amazing year at LSU. Yeah. So. College, you yeah, will. Yeah. Was the 90s. Hunter had yeah. a really yeah. good college year. College year should be your career. best. Uh, that was, they shouldn't that be your worst. They favorite. should be your best. For all of y'all out there in, in college, yeah. you go there for that. Yeah. yeah. So you, you went to LSU? 
Yes, sir. Yeah, good for you, man. Go Tigers. That's awesome. <laughs> Bro, I'm married into a den full of tigers. I didn't know it. We met on a blind date. Okay. <laughs> They're all from there, that area. Okay. I mean, all, even were, my great grandparents went to LSU. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so we've got some legacies. legacies. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah legacy, yeah. LSU. Yeah. My from my great grandparents to my grandparents, my parents, all my aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody. Hmm. I didn't have that growing up. We don't have that in my line. No, no, <laughs> so, no legacy in mine. Well, I mean, we military. Did, yeah. All right, let's get. That was good. That was a good question. Yeah. All right, man. Tell me, just before we start, say your say your name. How, Bedro, you, how will you say it? Pedro Skulian. Or you can call me Pedro Coulion. like everybody else. Coolian, right? Coolian. Coolian. Yeah. Like Coolio Coolian. The only other place I've heard that name, and mm-hmm. tell me if I'm off on this. Have you ever seen The Usual Suspects? Yeah, of course. The police detective, David. I don't know. His last his name. name. Y'all share the same last name. Maybe I'm off. How in the yeah. world do you remember that? Because uh, it was a kick ass name. Yeah. Well, okay. And he, he played a great part in that yeah. movie. I'm bro. When Kaiser Soze started walking normal, I freaked out. Bro, <laughs> when I was like I knew it. Me, my name, and they don't recognize me. I say that sometimes. You say, Ka- oh, they, sure, Tyler Durden, Kaiser Soze. There's a few. Really? My go-to. No one catches it. Every now and again, somebody will yeah. snicker, and I'll be like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's how I know if they speak the language. Man. Right, right. <laughs> if they're hip to it. If they're hip to that. Yeah. We speak the same language. That's uh, okay. Great. So, but <laughs> where, where were you born? I was born in Armenia. I was born in a village called Kirovakan in Armenia, which at the time was under communist rule. So dirt dirt roads. Uh, everyone had a little farm, little piece of farmland on, in a village and um, in Kirovakan. And I laugh about this because I now own a ranch in Temecula, California, 26 acres. We've got like 200 and some odd animals that we've rescued and we've got a whole bunch of goats. But I had a pet goat in Armenia. So imagine me at three, four years old, five years old, like just like a dog would follow you around. This is like, I was like a baby Borat now that I think about it. <laughs> like I had a goat that would follow me yeah. around and it was like trained. I, I would stop, it would stop, I would have it sit. They're smart. Yeah, yeah, goats are really smart. They are. Yeah, and over here they're farm animals, but over there yeah. they were a pet. And we had dogs too, but I had a goat. That is so funny. Yeah. yeah. So do you remember that village? I do, I remember that village. And then when my dad became a member of the communist party, we moved to Yerevan, which is the uh, capital of Armenia. And there he got a job and a promotion. And that's actually where he began to kind of squirrel away some money by um, doing some work. He was a tailor and he oversaw like 70 other seamstresses and tailors who made suits for... Um, so, you know, everything in, in the Soviet Union and Russia was owned by the government, right? Check. So. So he worked for a men's clothing manufacturer. And he had figured out that if he has his seamstresses and tailors put the patterns real close together, the material that they give him to cut out vests and jackets and pants, for every like 20 full suits they make, he'd have enough material left over that he could scroll and take home, make a suit, sell it on the black market. And then he saved up 25 to 26,000 rubles and in 1980, bribed an official in the Soviet government to allow us to go on vacation into Italy, where we then went to the American consulate. For 10 days, they pumped my dad for information because uh, he was a member of the Communist Party. And they kept, he kept coming back to the little hostel that we lived in, in Rome, Italy, uh, frustrated because he goes, they don't understand that if... I didn't accept this privilege of being in the Communist Party that I'd be shipped off to Siberia. So technically they ask, hey, you, you know, would you like to- Either in or out. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he has to say, yes, of course, I'll take this privilege with honors, right? But if he didn't, he'd be shipped out. And they're that strict on the t- the, the one suit that slips out. They're that strict. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, yeah. Is, is, why is that such a thing? Well- If you don't mind me asking, I'm just curious. They- never. Have, I've never seen that, so I, don't, I can't- possibly imagine what that yeah. feels like so imagine having water rationed electricity rationed i remember all of that we would go my mom would fill up the bathtub with water in the morning when they would turn on the water and so we would take showers at a public bath right and you wear like sandals because you don't want to get your feet touch your feet in there and um everything was rationed food was rationed 
and the year was 1980. So when you think about it, the Soviets were at war with Afghanistan. And we being Armenian, and Armenia being under, basically taken over by the Soviet Union, my brother was about to turn 19 years old, which would then enlist him in the, in the Soviet, in the Red Army. And my mom and dad kept seeing these young men coming back with limbs missing. No different than what we experienced during the last 20 years. My dad was like, there's no way that like, not only did we get taken over by the Soviet Union, but now my son has to go fight a war for them. Like, there's no way. So before my brother can turn 19, he saved up enough money. And, and they knew like people didn't want to stay there. And so you had to say you're going on vacation to Italy because you can't say, well, I'm going on vacation to America, mm -hmm. right? Because Italy is common to sympathizers. And so it made sense. And so we left everything behind. We had to make it look like we're going on vacation to Italy. Two suitcases, family of five. I was six years old at the time. And so we made that great escape, but he had to squirrel away so much material and make suits. And in fact, one of the time, I think word had gotten out that he's attempting to do something because there was a knock on the door. It was already dark, maybe 8, 8.30 p.m. in this, uh, everybody lived in apartments, like flats. And we, once he was a member of the Communist Party, we lived in a nicer flat. So there were some perks and he had access uh, with his, they gave him a new passport, his was bright red. And he would wear it here, like on his, uh, in his jacket, and you would see the top of it, CCCP. That's how you knew. Yeah. And like he had access to anything at that point. And he never took advantage of that, except where food was concerned. Like he could otherwise have access to anything. He left it in a drawer. The only time he'd put it there and take my mom and me to the grocery store, or it wasn't really a grocery store. They're like small little convenience store looking things, like a bread store, a cheese store, butter, right? Uh, things like dairy and stuff was when we needed food because then he can get front of the line he can get the stuff that's in the back that's being stored away for people like him and then everyone else would have to wait in line and possibly not get access to the food but anyway so he would scroll away material and one of the time i think word had gotten out there was a knock at the door and it was two kgb agents from our neighborhood and they come in and they line us all up along the wall in the hallway and they're asking my dad in Russian. My dad tells me the story later because uh, my dad spoke Russian, Turkish, Arabic, Armenian. And then when we came here, he was 45 years old. He learned English fluently. My yeah, God. We just celebrated his 90th birthday. Huh. Wow. An amazing human being. Amazing human being. Um, Man, where, where's he at right now? Yeah, invite him over. Anaheim, California. <laughs> oh, we didn't get him in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. An amazing, amazing man. Yeah. And so, anyways, he. He's given a tour of the, of the of our flat to the two agents who are looking for chalk, thimbles, anything, a meter stick, anything that shows that you're making something. He would hide things so well, they found nothing. And in Russian, he tells them, hey, let's not make this a wasted trip for you. So they sat at the kitchen table all night while me, my brother, my mom, and my older sister sat in the living room watching them drink vodka all night yucking it up, laughing, and then my dad sends him off. And I think it was within within six or eight months, we were on our way to Italy. And then from Italy, after they pumped my dad for information, um, they let us have political asylum and we moved to California because he knew one guy in all of the United States and it was like a friend of a friend in California. Yeah, that was our And we're in state. Anaheim? Santa Ana. Santa Ana. And then from there, now they live in Anaheim, yeah. So how long did you say you were in Rome? 10 days. 10 days. Yeah, and there was these hotels that were like hostels that were dedicated to refugees that were escaping. Uh, so there was like the, the Russian Jews were escaping at the time. So there, these hotels were dedicated to Russian Jews. These hotels were dedicated to Armenians. These hotels were dedicated to this other race. And it was just that way. And there were proprietors who were giving up certain number of rooms out of each of their hotels to us immigrants mm -hmm. because they believed in the cause mm -hmm. yeah it was it was That's, pretty rad have you been back i i went back in 1995 a uh, couple years after the the uh, communism fell f f freaking weird man like this this is like the russian way for you or i guess the communist way where my dad's dad is buried his cemetery they decided that after communism fell that they're going to build like an apartment complex there because now there's democracy and so word had gotten out that if you have anyone in the cemetery, you got to move them and you have this much time. 
<laughs> so since my dad left, he's like, I'm not going back. Like, he still doesn't trust him. So my brother and I, my brother's, I'm the oops baby. So my brother's 14 years older. My sister's 16 years older. So I was in my early 20s. My brother's, whatever, in his thir mid-30s. We go to Armenia. We go to the village in Kirovakan. We find his grave. We have an excavator come and take everything and we take it to the new cemetery and we have like the priest guy do his thing and build a fence around it take a picture show it to my dad and he just had peace of mind but like they were going to build apartments over this grave like just because it's land and it's beautiful land yeah was there still people buried under there i would imagine so like people who just didn't have the means or didn't go. know that mm -hmm. that was that was happening wow yeah, yeah. What an incredible did you go back to the village that you were from yeah yeah it's it, it had evolved like there was obviously normal looking roads but i recognized my grandma's house where we went to often uh like this very steep stone staircase that went down um like her chicken coop true story in her the backyard of her of her house she had all these like pear trees apple trees a chicken coop and one time a rooster gave chase to me so i'm like four or five years old and this rooster is like angry and it's like pecking at me and I'm running. And the only place I could run into is the outhouse to get away from it. So I run into the outhouse, giant hole in the ground. And I was like, well, while I'm in here, I'm gonna take a piss. <laughs> and so I kind of squat over it and to take a piss as a kid, take my pants off and I fall in. <gasps> oh no. So I got like one leg sticking out, one arm and both arms sticking out. My cousin, she hears me yelling. She comes and she like pulls me out I would have just taken a dive into the shitter otherwise. Oh, God. When I think about my childhood, bro, it's nutty. Like, it, it's it's nutty. Like, it's like I, I have two different lives, like the life in in America and then the life that I had in, in Armenia. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's crazy. So when you got to America, what was that like? What my dad told me it was going to be like, he, he, he kind of lied. Um, he meant well, but he was like, man, America is so much better than... Because remember, I didn't see the bad parts of Armenia, right? I was a kid. I had friends, especially once we moved to Yerevan, my last two years in Armenia, he was a member of the Communist Party. We had access to more stuff, food, et cetera. I had a giant fur coat, like as a six-year-old that came down to my ankles. And so when it was snowing, like I had a fur coat, all the other kids had like, didn't have much. And so I was living a better life. And we come here and all of a sudden we're living in, in an apartment in some guy's spare bedroom in an apartment, family of five, for 30 days, he's like, you can live in my spare bedroom, but after 30 days, you guys have to leave. Um, so he helped us get set up on Section 8 housing, that, that gentleman, my dad's friend's friend, Section 8 housing, food stamps, Medi-Cal, um, and then helped my dad get a job, like two days in the United States. He had a paper route, by the end of the week, he was working at a pizzeria as a busboy and the paper route, and was pumping gas at a gas station. And my brother and sister, both older, um, each got a job. But we were in Section 8 housing, and now I've got the funny bull haircut. I don't speak English. Chunky little kid. Uh, clothes that my mom, like, found, like, in, like not even a thrift store. Like, I, I think they're like, here you go. Here's what you guys can wear. Like, whoever the they were, some government officials that helped us with the process of getting our uh, Section 8 housing. And so I had a shirt. Do you remember the, Her uh, the Munsters? Mm, of course. Yeah. It was a tight green sweatshirt that was way too tight on me. <laughs> and with Herman Munster, and it said Herman underneath. And so they put me in school. So we get here June 16, 1980. You know, I'm, that's, your, that's your call sign now in this, in yeah, this house, Herman. right? Bro, well, I gotta, <laughs> it's got to be. I got a classified piece of paper on you right here, pal. <laughs> and on the back of it, it's going to say Herman. <laughs> and then when, when you get out of here and I get your phone number, it's gonna, it's, that's what it's going to say. Okay, so they put me into, into elementary school, kindergarten in September. We get here in June, September. So I've... Don't this know. Is 1980. 80. Yeah. So there was no like ESL yet and any of that stuff. And they put me into a uh, special ed class because they're like, uh, he can't speak English, funny haircut, special ed. And uh, <laughs> yeah. So I always wear the Herman Munster shirt. So kids start calling me Herman and I start answering to it. So actually, I will answer to Herman because I'm just conditioned to since Brilliant. a little puppy. Yeah. Yeah. And so then I went. I actually worked out well though for you. That's cool. That's cool. It did. Call sign. Yeah. It's yeah. not bad. Yeah. And so each, you know, we moved around a lot. And each time we did, they put me in a different elementary school. So they would ask, kids would ask me, what's your name? Herman. So then I just started to volunteer that. Herman, right? But the teachers were like, no, it's Pedro. So I'm like, right. 
Right. So, oh so it was God. just so weird living in Section 8 housing, gangbangers. Um, you know, my first friend in America was black. His name is Dwayne. Y'all still buddies? No, man. I wish I, I don't remember his last name, but his mom would always invite me to, his, to their apartment to feed me because my parents both had jobs. His mom was stayed home. His dad would had a job. He had a little sister, and uh, he, he, dude, he Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne. If you're out there, man, hey, y'all find this guy. Shade Tree Apartments. I remember that too. Like just such an awesome. I got human some detectives being. on the team, man. Those man, I would love that. Down. I would love to connect. What with that town? Uh, by this point, we were in Anaheim. In Anaheim, yeah. Shade Tree Apartments, 1980, Dwayne. Yeah, that's like some Karate Kid stuff, man. Yeah, yeah, and he he taught me. He let me into their friend group. We were playing snake in the grass, right? Where like all the kids line up on their knees and then one of them tries to run through and they just tackle you. Again, our generation, like bloody nose, busted yeah, yeah. up arms. It's like, all right, we're all friends now, you know? Heaven help they, you if you're playing in the pool because the games we played would drown you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. You that's how I learned games? to swim. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's how you learn how to swim and swim well. Bro, exactly. This foreigner did not know how to swim until I got tackled into the deep side. That's right. And then you learn. You so, learn. Yeah, yeah. Because your friends will let you almost drown. Mm-hmm. And then they'll pull you back in and be like, hey, you did great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did. Because then your parents, yeah. they, they're like, hey, don't come home hurt. Because I'll hurt you worse. That, that We had that going for us, too. I had a bicycle stolen. So about six months in, my dad had enough money, I think, for eight or nine bucks. He bought like this old rusty bike from a garage sale. Bicycle got stolen from me by some neighborhood thugs. I knew who had it. And he's like, go get it. Otherwise, I'm going to give you a worse beating than they gave you when... They stole your bike. I was like, shoot. So you're not wrong on that. That's just that's just how it was. Yeah. And so I went to go to go get my bike. And I was like, listen, I gotta get this bike and I'll fight every single one of you. So I'd rather do that than take a beating from my dad. Cause he had he used his keys mm. to hit me with. Yeah. He's a gentleman now. Oh my god. But gosh. imagine like you come to a new country, you're broke, you don't understand language, you're angry at the world. Like he had a lot of anger issues. Like he's a gentle, sweet man now. But I also remember my friends were put on restrictions. Because he's 90. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I can kick his ass now. <laughs> I, I, I was scared of my dad yeah. up to the day he freaking left. Yeah. I, I was yeah. always terrified of him. Yeah. They, our, parents, our dad's different. Yeah. That had to be terrifying for your dad, though, as the man of the house. Yeah. I mean, family of five. Family of five, bringing them to a foreign country where he mm-hmm. has to learn the language. He has to figure out how everything works. Because you hear one thing when you're in another country of how America is. Yeah. But once you get here, you realize, oh, no, you actually have to work for it. Yeah. And you have to work your butt off. Um, and all the things available today, like where they give away free cell phones and houses and yeah. cars to people. Like, that didn't exist. Yeah. Like, we're talking 1980. So he's like, okay, I got 30 days in this guy's one-bedroom apartment, like in the one bedroom with the family of five. And then we're out. So we got to get that Section 8 housing set up. And like, that's a lot of stress for him. And I remember him telling my mom in Armenian that we would run out of money before we run out of month. And he hated having to make the decision between do we have power, uh, electricity or water? Cause we can't pay both bills. He obviously always chose water cause we could light candles. And so my mom would just light candles until we, the month he got paid and then we would have electricity. But that's just how our first few years in America was. And, and I loved it uh, and I loved it because if I ended up living in Armenia, I would have either been a taxi driver or a mechanic or a vendor on the street side, a street corner. Nothing wrong with any of that, but like the life that he gave me by risking his life was huge, huge, hugely different. Were your older siblings upset? Yeah, they they didn't assimilate as well as I did. My brother being 19 when we got here, sister being 21. Um, my brother had a girlfriend that he left and i think they were pretty serious and i think that would have been the one for him and so there was plenty of nights that i would hear them crying together and then they would go argue with my dad fight with my dad about we want to go back and he's like we're not going back this is our new life we're not going back and so it took a longer time for them to assimilate than me because you're uh, a kid i'm I'm a kid like within the first year i learned a language and i'm good Mm to go yeah did yeah. they have a? I'm sure that at 19, learning a different language is super hard. Yeah, they still have a heavy accent. Do they? Yeah, whereas I lost my accent very quickly. The hardest thing to be in, in America is a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're, I mean, that just, no matter how much discipline, it's just tough out there for them. Mm-hmm. 
And then if you come here as a visitor, you can be a visitor almost your entire life here. And that's a different type of life as opposed to when you actually dig in. Right. And we, and we know who they are. I mean, we see you, right? Yeah. And you can tell who the people who actually hustle around here and do it. There's, mm-hmm. there's, it's almost as if America has everyone's life tucked in this one place. And if you see something you like, you can actually go get into it. Yeah. We give you that opportunity. But you got to earn it. That's it. You have to earn it. And, and my dad was willing to. And he built a little tailor shop for himself in Anaheim. And that tailor shop ended up buying him a house, a couple of small little condominiums like rental properties. Uh, his claim to fame was Backstreet Boys. When they were on tour at Disneyland, they needed a tailor. And it was recommended they come to Joseph's Tailoring. Uh, that was his tailor <laughs> shop. That. Yeah. So he has a picture of the Backstreet Boys autographed, you know. And he Do you know them? I, I don't know the Backstreet Boys. No. Like I, I was a kid when they came, and I probably didn't give it. Oh, oh, I remember. Yeah, there, you say yeah. that name around yeah. most of. The, oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone lights up. Yeah, That's yeah. But great. but my dad was just so proud of that little tailor shop, and and he 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 accomplished the American dream. He did, and he lives in a house that's paid off now. And yeah, I mean, what more could you want? Yeah. Did him and your mom stay together? Yes, uh, my mom died this past September of dementia. Sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, she she died this past That's September. That's a tough disease. It was a, it was a horrible disease, bro. To have your mom not know your name, uh, not know your kids' names, um, look at you and go, "Who are you?" In Armenian. And uh, yeah, so this Mother's Day a couple of days ago, I went to her grave. Sorry. Um, that was it. Was tough. Your mom was boy. I am too. Yeah, yeah. yeah I am and, too. and she wasn't the most loving, but in her harsh, communist way, she was. You, you know what I mean? I got you, man. I got yeah. you. I, I know exactly uh, what you're sorry. talking about. Sorry, <laughs> I'm a cry. If I see someone hey, crying, okay, it's okay. So what, what's the, what's the haven't gone through that because we have that in our family. My what's, grandma has dementia right now. So what, what's the best piece of advice you give somebody who's dealing with that? Lots of pictures, and then when they are there, like their memory will kick in, like record as much of it as you can um, for your own good for yourself uh, I was there till the final moment she died I was holding her hand and just rubbing her forehead in her bed and I made sure that she had an Armenian hospice caretaker and uh, I fucking regret they put her they brought in a hospital bed the only thing I regret is there was a you know that bar they put up yeah and I was leaning over and uh Bro, for seven hours, I was holding her hand and rubbing her head and just spoon feeding her water. I wasn't smart enough to lower that fucking bar. She's not going to roll off anywhere. I've got her. I could have had more contact with her, and I didn't until days later it hit me. Like, that's, um, I have that regret, and I have the regret of not seeing her enough because I was growing my companies, and they just didn't understand what I was doing and whatever. And uh, lots of pictures, lots of videos. And when they're there, they're lucid. Um, enjoy that time. Yeah, and don't take anything personal when they yell at you and tell you you stole their money. <laughs> it she happens. would just yell and scream. Oh, yeah. She would just yell and scream like, "I'm like, mom, I didn't steal your money. Dad didn't steal your money." Would you say your dad did? She would, she would blame my dad. <laughs> yeah, 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 blame him. Yeah, yeah. My grandma's going through that right now. She's in the early stages, so thank God she still remembers who we are. <laughs> Yeah. But she's in this phase where she loses everything and she thinks someone stole it. Yeah. So it's, you know, and she wants to know how much money is in her bank account. And right. our family has taken over her bank account and pays all of her bills. So she doesn't understand she's fine and she's taken care of, but she panics about it. She wants to go to the bank face to face with the teller. And even though she won't believe the teller yeah. because this is, as the disease progresses, heavier doses of paranoia set in it's and then also when the sun goes down like during dusk Mm -hmm. uh is when the dementia acts up the most so we would have to cover the curtains and when i did some research uh, we'd close the draw the blinds in her house when i did the research like that was a normal like like it's called sundowning yeah yeah there's an it's an actual thing i've read so much about it we just had to put my grandma in a home and it's it breaks my heart, but yeah, it is the worst disease. It is, and and the w- anyway, we don't need to go down the rabbit hole. But the way that disease kills you is it eats away at the part of the brain that controls your breathing, so you suffocate to death, mm-hmm. right? And so I, 
held my mom's hand while she was suffocating to death, helplessly couldn't do anything for her. Like, what do you do? Anyways, she was a strong ass woman. When I ran away from school, kindergarten, because it's a long story, but I was a kid. I can't speak English. They, you know, they in kindergarten they put you in those little taped off. Sit here, and the school teacher is going to read the thing. Mm -hmm. Went from the desks to there, like reading time. I'm like trying to tell them I got to pee, but I don't know how to say it in English. But I know where the restroom is in the kindergarten. It's like in it's in the classroom. It's not even outside. So she's like, I can't understand you. So finally, I'm just I just get up to try and go pee, and she yells at me, the teacher, to sit down, and I do, and I could only hold it for so long, so I pee myself, right? Mm -hmm. And all the kids start laughing. So I was like, fuck this, I'm out of here. And I, during the break, I take off, I leave school. It's not like the schools today where everything's on lockdown. The principal's chasing me down the road. I'm running towards my apartment complex. They called my mom, apparently. My mom's running this way, and I'm running along the curb of the street. And the principal is gaining on me. I was a fat kid and I was wearing corduroy pants. And like when I'm running, it's like, <laughs> make it sparks. Yeah, man, those things spark bro, up. Bro, all my clothes were ill fitting. Like, God bless my mom, but get me something that freaking fit. You got to be the toughest son bitch I ever met, bro. I just dealt with so much I, I, bullying. I bet. Yeah, yeah, but you're telling me the stack you had, and it's the corduroys just sent it to a different level, man. Bro, I could like with feel the, the bowl heat. cut. Yeah, yeah, I could feel the heat. Like, God bless you, man. I was gonna combust. <laughs> you know, the because I was funky looking, bro. But I mean, like you, you know. Yeah. Even the most dedicated gym goers struggle with consistency. Between the commute, waiting for weights, and all the hassle that comes with making time for the gym, it can be easy to skip out on a workout or two. That's why I am so pumped about my tonal. My unit's still on the way, but every time I watch one of these videos, I get more and more hyped. Marty in the living room scouted out the exact spot I wanted in, just itching to knock out a set. With tonal, you can train the way that you want, right at home. It's the world's smartest strength training system, all powered by AI so that it learns with every single rep, delivering workouts personalized just for you. No more crowded gyms, just effective, tailored training whenever you're ready. And here's the real kicker. Right now, Tonal is offering our listeners $200 off your Tonal purchase with promo code TNQ. That's Tonal.com with promo code TNQ for $200 off your purchase right now, tonal.com with promo code TNQ for $200 off. And uh, so, so I'm running, but my mom, uh, I saw my mom coming and she's crying because she could see that I was just like every day going to school and I didn't want to. As the principal was gaining on me, I stopped. I saw a broken beer bottle. I grabbed a piece of broken glass, and I wanted to cut my arm. I knew that if I cut my arm in the right place, I didn't know where, that I would bleed to death. I just wanted to die, right? And so I would bleed to death, and my mom's screaming at the principal in Armenian, and he understood because it's a mother's shriek. And he understood, and he stopped right in his tracks. She's crying. She came to me, put the glass down, picked me up. And within a week, there was a Armenian-speaking, English and Armenian-speaking tutor there helping me out i think they were like hey this little fucker's gonna try and kill himself let's not make a scene let's just get him what he needs and so from glendale california the capital of armenia other than armenia is glendale california they brought in some uh, tutor twice a week to to help me out and she she was a blessing she helped me out so much that's a good story man you oh so, god man the waterworks what are you guys I doing know. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I her crying. we overlooked that whole tutor the ones that come in and help us on the interim? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But even to have your mom's fierceness of, like, make it happen, help him, even though you say she wasn't um, an emotional or comforting person, she had that motherly instinct that yeah. she needed to protect her son yeah. and get yeah. him help. Yeah. Yeah. She, she probably saved my life that day, you know, because soon after that, I was just, I hated school so much that I just, like, I'd rather be dead. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be dead. How long did it take you to pick that up when you get better? How long what? How long did you progress? Uh, when you start getting better? 
pretty pretty well. Like within a year, I was assimilated pretty well. Like is the language barrier. The language barrier is important because you know kids. Once we speak the language, like we can. Hey, you want to play ball? You want to do this? You want to dig a hole to China? Like I'm literally doesn't matter. matter. Right? Yeah. Whatever. Our generation would fucking dig holes to China I straight to the I bottom. Actually, was digging holes yeah. to China. We tried it. We no one today it, is man. trying to dig a hole to China. Yeah. <laughs> And Come you know, on the other side. Yeah. I what? remember a little kid named Robbie. He and I would, like, behind the backstop, the baseball backstop, we would try to, like, dig a hole in China, and then we'd cover it up with twigs so, like, no one fills yeah. it in. All you millennials, keep that in the back of your head when you're messing with us. That right? is so <laughs> true. We'll put you in a hole so deep, man. All <laughs> you end up in China. In China. <laughs> I yeah. remember that. I remember wanting to dig a hole in China, and I remember being terrified of quicksand. As an adult, <laughs> I've never seen quicksand. Really? But as a kid, that was like one of the big fears. Did you ever everyone. see it? No, I still have never oh, seen it. Oh, just in your mind, you were like, this our, thing could kill me. It was like sure. one of those just myths that would yeah, go yeah. around or right. rumor like, oh, don't ever get caught in quicksand. Right. It'll suck you up. And sure. so I was always so afraid of like, what's quicksand? I mean, I've never seen it, but I was It's real. Yeah. yeah. You've probably seen it, I, I'm I, sure. You don't want to get, it's real, don't mess yeah. with it. <laughs> What's it made? And now I'm curious. Like what? I, mean, I, don't, I don't know, know if you're a quick sand time. that moves quickly. Just it's the best I got for you, man. It's, it's sinkholes. I think if there's water, like <laughs> sand, <laughs> quick sand, yeah, sand yeah. that moves sand. quickly. They kept, kept it yeah. simple. It's in the name. Yeah. <laughs> sand that has swallowed me quickly, right? Oh That's had where I came from. Oh my god. What do you say happened? Yeah. I don't know, man. It was, it was, it was a very quick sand. So how sand is your, me went down yeah. pretty quick. <laughs> how it? Once you learned English and you got over those bumps, how was your high school and Horrible. beyond that? I, I hated all of school. Like till today, I'll see a back to school like advertisements and my body reacts, I get sweaty palms. I, school was not made for me and I was not made for school. In fact, also being a fat kid, like you're invisible, right? Because the gothic kids, remember we had gothic kids. I don't Absolutely. know what they have today, but we had gothic kids. That's how we were broken down. It was, yeah. it was, it was, you know. Yeah, like so the jocks didn't want jocks, me. the skaters. The, yep. Yeah, I guess exactly. The skaters didn't want me. The goths didn't want me. The nerds didn't want me. The musicians didn't want me. And so during lunch, I would just walk the quad. And then in science class, eleventh grade science class, there was this guy named Dave. He was uh, the center on the high school football team. And so Jack built like a fucking brick shit house, and. Like we would talk and banter the whole time, but soon as we were out of class, he didn't know me. I was invisible, right? Like, isn't that crazy? We do that. I walked by his jock friends and like trying to make eye contact with Dave. Like he didn't see me. But in science class, we were buds. So I'm like, dude, how do I get jacked like you? Like, how do I get in shape? Because the following year was senior year, and I knew I wanted to go to the prom, and I had this the hots for this girl named Nakaya. And since I'm invisible, no one sees me and knows that I exist. I needed Nakaya to know I exist, so I figured get jacked. And so Dave took me to the school gym, and then uh, I worked out there once with him. Intimidating as ever, man. Like I didn't know. Like first time in the gym is always yeah, tough. yeah. And imagine like I'm 17 years old, yeah. wobbly bar and everything, right? And these guys are like, we'll have the worst there. is when people are in shape in there. Yeah, that's yeah. that's why most people won't go in. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're right. Which I'm, is when I'm, you're supposed to go. That's in. when you're supposed to go in. Yeah. Like we want to see you in there. Yeah. We we get that. Yeah. That's how you get that help. But yeah. in high school, it works. People like, why are you in here? If, you know, I, I mean, which is funny because now that I I realize, I don't know about high school because maybe they're all like young studs. But gyms today, most people in shape in gyms have a story of like, hey, I was either a small pip squeak yeah. or a fat kid. And they're the most kindest people. Like they'll help you adjust the weight. Yeah, the therapists. They're yeah. like therapists in yeah. there, man. They're right. Yeah. That's where they hide. They yeah. hide. The, that's and the, those You're are right. the ones you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yet people are so intimidated by going into the gym. Like that's the place to go. So, anyways, he was kind enough to take me in the school gym. So all summer long, I worked out at Bally's Total Fitness. Got a gym membership. Worked out at Bally's Total Fitness, and uh, ate the best that I could. He, he said, "Eat a lot of tuna fish." And so I had a lot of tuna fish. And he said, don't eat a lot of sugar and bread. And so I didn't. I came back like 30 pounds lighter senior year. And How long did it take you to do that? All summer long. So How much were you weighing when you went in? Dude, I was like 220 pounds. So we're talking about like gelatinous fat? Or just yeah, fat? Everything I, I had titties. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had titties. Right, right, right. I had like yeah, 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 yeah. over my... Yeah, yeah, muffin top. Yeah, yeah. Like okay, everything. so I was just that's soft. pretty good to drop the... Yeah, I get it. Soft. Yeah. but you know, I mean, if I tell the, the kids who are overweight, man, I think you tell them the one thing is like, hey, look, you can drop that quick. Yeah, just get your butt in there. Especially as a young man. As a young man, your testosterone's up there. You just got to eat right and work out. It's like you're sitting on a fuel you don't know about, bro. <laughs> I, I, I was, dude. I was the opposite. I was skinny. Okay, I, I was a hard gainer. 
But I was in there with the fat kids. Yeah, and you being tall, like you you took yeah, probably a while. Dude, yeah. I looked like a stork that swallowed a turtle and it got stuck halfway through my, my hips. I, like I grew like a Frankenstein. It was weird. Huh. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I was that kid too, you know. The, 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 the <laughs> fat kid is talking about like I need to lose weight. I'm like, dude, who cares, bro? I was like, <laughs> right, give it to me. I, right, I'm trying right, to gain it. Right. There's always the opposite. Always. So when you got in there, like well, I looked like a, a, the number ten sticking, standing next to the dude I was with. Right. He was real big. I was real small. But we we stayed in there, man. Yeah, man. Uh, but you know, in in those three months of summer, I lost about 34 pounds. I don't. I say about, but it's exactly 34 pounds because I would weigh myself religiously at that gym. And then I came in, I wouldn't say jacked, but I was leaner, like had some shape to me now. Uh, I never had the confidence to ask Nakaya to the prom, so I never made it to the prom, and Nakaya, I'm sure, went with some stud. And, uh, but that changed my life, man. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna be a personal trainer when I, when I leave school, because I didn't, I was gonna try college. I went to junior college for 34 days, Fullerton Junior College, or, or 35 days, just, just over a month. I knew that wasn't for me, so I went and got certified as a personal trainer, and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Like, not because I want to change people's bodies, but I saw the psychological impact it had on me. Talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because most people leave that part, and I try to say, hey, man, there's something that comes with this, with with this package. There's a new kind of mindset that that actually comes in there. It works together, sometimes and independently. How long were you working out before you start feeling that? Well. Or when someone acknowledged it? So... You know, I started school late, right? So I graduated, I was almost 19 when I graduated high school. I graduated high school and then turned 19. My birthday's in July. Uh, by 20 years old, so I had worked out two years by that point. I had put on a good, you know, maybe 10, 12 pounds of muscle. But by 21, I discovered something called Sestanon. Yeah. Sestanon 250. It's size a maker. Size maker. Testosterone from Mexico that has four different blends of testosterone. And I was like, I just inject that into my leg and my butt? Okay. I could do that. And that's where like, I started getting bigger and stronger and took on powerlifting and uh, really like, did a deep dive, read Bill Phillips' book, World Anabolic Review. Like, you name the book on steroids and muscle building and eating, I was reading it, doing it, and like, that became my religion like, all into my like, almost uh, late 20s. So um, when you say that name, that, yeah. that stuff Bill was... Phillips, yeah. yeah, or Cessna on you. Oh, yeah, yeah, both yeah. of that. Yeah. Both them. Yeah, yeah. I pick, pick up talking about some strength, yeah. bro. And I was just driving to Mexico at the time. Like it's not like today with cartels and shit. Hey. You just drive into Mexico, go into a pharmacia, and you go Cestanon. on. But go, things were different when we were kids. Yeah, yeah, and they just give you bags of it. I would hide it in my car and then drive through the border and just tell them I was partying in Rosarito. And I never partied because I just wanted to, you know, get get lean and jacked. Yeah. Oh my God. It changed my life. It changed my life. And so, but being fat, this is what, they have this whole new culture of fat acceptance today. And I'm going to tell you this right now, no good thing comes from being fat. Like it's, it's not about body shaming. I'm not body shaming. Never mind the health disease. And people go, well, I, I'm healthy. You're healthy now. Like there's a ticking time bomb of diabetes in you. There's a, if you're fat, over fat, there's a ticking time bomb of diabetes. Ticking time bomb of hypertension, which means like a blood vessel can burst and there goes a stroke. Ticking time bomb of heart disease. Like just you're just one more piece of plaque away from your heart going, boom, I can't pump. Ticking time bomb of cancer. Cancer rates are higher when, when you're over fat. All these reasons. Never mind self-esteem, confidence, depression, anxiety levels, right? Never mind all those things. And finally, let's go on the psychological level, and I've got no degree in psychology, so please take this for a grain of salt. I believe that you can only love the people around you to the capacity that you can love yourself. And if I'm fat, that is the highest level of self-hate. If I'm fat and out of shape, that is the highest level of self-hate. That means I don't love myself. That means I can't love you to the capacity that I should. If you're my spouse, if you're my kid, if you're my friend, you're my business partner. And I know that because when I transformed, I had a higher level of self-worth, self-esteem, confidence. My character changed. My habits changed. I, I, my standards increased. All those things happened because you fall in love with yourself. You're like, I did something that was not an immediate thing. It takes delayed gratification. It takes constantly eating clean because you know what do they say abs are made in the kitchen right it, it takes focus discipline consistency you do it through injuries you didn't sleep well go work out anyway it's raining and cold outside go work out anyway you're traveling go work out anyway oh you're under the weather keep eating clean and work out anyway and that's how you get there and then i took all those traits and i transferred that into the business world and it turns out all those exact traits is how you become a millionaire like perfectly transfer trans, transferable and then instead of telling my kids, eat right, work out, 
I just demonstrated that to them, and they're both lean and jacked, both athletes, amazing humans. Yeah. Oh, that's the way it is with the kids. Right. You, don't, you can't tell them to do one thing and go off. Yeah. No, man. Yeah. That's big in my house, too. Yeah. yeah. So how long? What, so what did you, did you end up opening gyms, or what was your Yeah, your so I, was a, I, was a, I started off as a starving personal trainer uh, working at a big box gym, LA Fitness, but I met a mentor, and, and there's, there's a value to mentors. And I remember reading your book, and there was a gentleman that took you and your brother and some other young men through correct some training right, That's right. And i've done that my whole life yeah i'm a big proponent of that mm-hmm. mentors are just of having a mentor like built-in guidance you know and they've been there done that they're they've got experience and so it turns out when you're a personal trainer and you're broke all of your clients are rich because they could afford a personal trainer yeah. now they're paying the gym they're not paying me the gym was paying me 12 bucks an hour right and this is in my like early 20s but one of my personal training clients his name is jim franco i just saw him a few days ago he's 81 years old now He's been my mentor for, one of my mentors for 20 some odd years. He, he asked me one morning, he goes, hey, why are you so tired on a Monday morning? Like you're coming off a weekend. I'm like, Jim, not only am I a personal trainer here, I work at Disneyland as a busboy, but I, on the weekends, I work as a bouncer at a gay bar. And, and it's a true story, I worked as a bouncer at a gay bar because the gay bar paid more than the straight bar because skinheads would come to gay bash every night and it was our job to make sure everyone from the bar made it to their cars safely. And so that job lasted like four months. Like I can't keep getting in fights every weekend. Like I don't want this in my life. And so I'm telling Jim like, man, I'm, I, I go to bed like two in the morning. I'm here at five in the morning to train my first client. Of course I'm tired. He goes, and he called me kid. He goes, kid, that's because you don't know how to sell. I was like, I beg to differ. I sold you a six month training program three times a week. He goes, no, you didn't. You took my order. I came in here looking for six months of personal training. I wanted to work out three days a week. You're a waitress. You just took my order. And he said it that way. And no one had ever been that brutally honest with me ever in my life. And he goes, you're like a waitress. You just took my order. He goes, I see you let people walk all the time who should be buying personal training from you. I was like, holy smokes. And so being an arrogant young man, I was like, well, what should I do, Jim? The next day he brings me three books, Zig Ziglar, Tom Hopkins, Brian Tracy books on sales and persuasion, influence. That led to books on personal development from Tony Robbins, et cetera, and like this whole world of marketing, personal development, sales opened up. And before you know it, I got clients back to back. I've quit my two other side jobs and I'm full-time personal trainer. I'm making commissions now on top of my $12 an hour because I'm selling big packages, right? And then handing those clients off to other trainers because my schedule is full. And so I'm telling Jim Franco, I'm like, man, I think I want to open up my own personal training studio. He goes, I agree, you should. I go, but I don't have the money, Jim. I'm not rich like you. Still a very condescending, crusty young man. And he goes, well, what if I loan you the money and become your business partner? So he loaned me $55,000 at 8% interest. I paid him back and he was still my 50% business business partner, which I realized that's a very, like, he was Shark Tank before Shark Tank. Like, he sharked me, um, but it was a great lesson to learn. And so I opened up. Better be taught from him. Yeah. Who else? And right? it gave you an opportunity that you would have never had. Exactly. Yeah. So I opened up four more gyms on my own after that one. All, all the name premier results. Ultimately, ended up selling them. They were all in San Diego. Um, mostly North County, San Diego. So I, that, probably I love that place, around. man. The only right. other, other than Texas, when I get off the plane in San Diego, yeah. I feel comfortable yeah. there. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure you have a kinship to San Diego. I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was yeah. reborn there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so once I sold those gyms, I went into coaching and consulting for personal trainers who wanted to open gyms because not only did I open one gym, I opened five small studios, like 2,000 square feet, just all one-on-one private training, and then sold them. Like I did something that in my industry didn't happen at the time. So I started coaching and consulting personal trainers. Then the housing market crashes in 2008, so one-on-one personal training is dead. That's where I came up with the idea of my first big business, Fit Body Boot Camp an outdoor boot camp that I would see all the time. I'm like, if I can bring this outdoor group training program indoors at equipment, the price of personal training goes down. It becomes more affordable and more convenient. So instead of one client training at 6 a.m., we can have 30 clients training in a group at 6 a.m. And instead of charging that one client $800 a month for four days a week, we're charging that one client $199 a month for five days a week, right? One on many instead of one on one. And that became 
what is now Fit Body Bootcamp, our international fitness franchise. We have hundreds of gyms across the U.S. and Canada, and we're about to franchise throughout Europe and Australia. But that was the Jim Franco. So my physical transformation going from fat to fit is how I got into fitness. Jim Franco, my first mentor, was the man who believed in me and was showed me the through hard, tough love. Talk about rite of passage. You know the book, uh, Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Hello. Jim Franco was my rich dad, now that I look back on it. Mm. And he that was the rite of passage into me literally becoming a man and taking becoming a man as, as a provider, like more serious. Like I could go and earn and, and create and build and not just be a knucklehead meathead, you know? Um, it takes another man walking in to teach you that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. He had confidence. When you're a kid and you're growing up, a lot of times those men are around you already, but they want to see if you're going to put some work in. Because mm -hmm. they're not just going to hand that, that gift that they have off to something that can't. First of all, you can't hold it. If you don't have any discipline, I give you the world, yeah. and you won't be able to keep it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then, I mean, you get your discipline from your dad, you get your manners from your mom. You're not really supposed to like your father. It says that in the good book. Mm -hmm. You're loved and beloved by your mama. And then once you, if a kid shows up, I give you any from, from, I'm asking, I'm asking you, like boil down your success to one thing. What, what is that? Is it discipline? Is it, what is it? What are we talking about? Discipline and singularity of focus. Like I know how to lock in. Turns out my OCD, the reason I wasn't good at school, we later found out that I have OCD. Well, I would hear a bird chirping outside and I'm like, oh, I wonder what kind of bird it is. What, what branches it sit on? Let me see if I can find it. And look, looking out the window. By the time I turn back to the marker board or chalkboard, so remember we had chalkboards. We oh, also yeah. had chalkboards, bro. Yeah. Remember the teacher's hands? Were yeah. White. Yeah. 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 And one kid would have to get up and erase it, and their nails would go yeah. on it, and it's like. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> God, a math teacher, Miss Leland. I want to hope she's good. I, she she could work a chalkboard. She you know, some of those teachers could yeah, just yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every letter looked like it was precise, oh, and there was yeah. depth. There was depth in that chalk line. Think how too, many man. times they wrote. Each That's letter, they, yeah. each number, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but that, that was huge for me. Singularity of focus and discipline. Those two things um, were massive. And the singularity of focus is I lock on. I, I'll lock on to something stupid sometimes. And so I got to like, hey, 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 get, get your attention here. But I would lock on the bird, forget what's going on on the chalkboard, and have like 1.4 GPA. Thank God for the Anaheim Union High School District. They literally just want to have you move along. Like I graduated because they didn't want a man with a beard in high school. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> hey, that, yeah, that's yeah, kind of weird. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Who's that creeper? Yeah. yeah. Especially when we were kids. Yeah. But that same singularity of focus that I can lock on to something and, and stay locked on, today we, they call it to have impulse control, right? Like I don't impulsively do things so is that what you say to a kid who has ocd just control your power mm -hmm. it's a superpower yeah control it, just, it doesn't it doesn't pay off in school it will pay off in life so is that how you say is that how you say that to them and that is exactly how i say it to them say hey, look i know you can't control it do the best you can stay yeah. focused yeah and also you got ocd you're you're more likely according to statistics you're more likely to have an addiction alcohol drugs pornography whatever well that's a human thing man right that is a human thing. <laughs> but I'll take anyone who's got an addictive personality. If I can change your addiction to something good, as my therapist said, good old Kevin Downing in Brea, California. He's like, he goes, look, you're, you're an addict and you got OCD. If you can just lock on to something, I'm like, like business? He goes, yep. He goes, start as many businesses as you want. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, you're going to lock on to something bad and find yourself in the gutter. I'm like, you are correct. It's like your targeting system is always on. That's a good way to put it. Like a, like a Terminator. And once it's and once it gets an app, especially after you feed it, yes. yes, and then it just gets insatiable. So he, that's a great piece of advice. Never heard put like that. Yeah. He's yeah. like, hey man, you got an appetite for something, and it's gonna eat. Yeah. So you make sure you feed it something. Feed good. it something good, yeah. and that's that's where we come in as parents. Yeah. With the younger ones, I'm kind of shifted my focus on what we had to go through in our lives and all the wars and everything in between. Like we we haven't been paying attention to, and behind us. Yeah. Exactly. So I think we've kind of finally slowed down. We were beat, beat up. Yeah. I mean, look at it. Man, we've been through a lot, yeah. our generation. A lot. A freaking lot, man. A lot. So it's it's, it's almost yeah. one of those where it's waning out and we're turning back around and get back to these mm -hmm. kids. Because you've been trained. Yeah. I mean, look what you've been through. And that discipline, that happened to me as well. Talk about that. So when you, it's almost like once you get to a certain level, uh, and, and I like to say it that way because the harder you work, something happens inside of you. Mm -hmm. And other people show up. It happens automatically. Like yep. you'll look a certain way, you'll change that, and then automatically God will put somebody else in there. Yeah. 
and they're there for that. Yeah, and, and I think what that is 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 confidence. People will ask me like, well, how how is confidence built? Well, you can read as many books as you want about confidence. You're not going to build confidence. Confidence is building is built when you make a promise to yourself and keep it. And each time you make a promise to yourself and keep it, you are building your reputation with yourself, right? And what, what Warren Buffett says, it takes 20 years to build your reputation, 20 seconds to ruin it. Mm -hmm. And so think about that. Each time you say, well, I'm going to wake up at 5.30 a.m. when my alarm goes off and then drink water and then go work out. Alarm goes off, you hit snooze, then you skip your workout. You broke two promises to yourself. Subconscious mind says, hey, you know what? You're a big fat loser. You're a hypocrite. You're not legit. It, well, it comes in. Well, it's like, All right, we, we'll get it this afternoon. Right. <clears throat> that never stops. Nope. Do you, do you still have that? I, I Look, when I get up, I'm like, hey, you know, it's... The I'm, conversation I'm, happens. The conversation always happens. Yeah. But but my character... It's completely changed. It's completely changed. So I'm like, all right, fat, I literally will like, all right, fat boy, get up. Like I have, what was that movie? Dodgeball? Mm-hmm. The, the dude where he's eating the pizza and he, like, he used to be a fat kid. Now he's fit. He's like, don't eat the pizza, fat boy. Don't <laughs> like that. That is me. Like, get up, fat boy. Don't hit. Don't hit the snooze button. Drink your water. Go in the shower. Turn on your good the music. I listen to Jack Johnson music in the morning because I wake up angry and crusty. And uh, Jack Johnson puts me in a good state of mind. I love Jack Johnson. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Banana Pancakes. Yeah. Right, one of my favorite songs. He's good. Angel, yet another. Anyways, um, so with that in mind, it's not that the conversation doesn't happen in your head. It's just we have built enough momentum in habitual behavior that our character is, I'm going to get up instead of hitting that snooze button. That's all. And if you don't understand what we talk about, I'm talking about your character as in if you were playing yourself in a movie. Yes. And the voice changes in your head from like, oh, I don't want to get up. It's cold. Like, get up. It's freaking cold. Let's yeah. get some. Yeah, yeah. It, it switches in your head over time. And it, I mean, it can come with an accent. You can play out however you want. Yeah. Whatever it takes to get you. I have that too. Don't it's native, important to cultivate that. You nailed it. To cultivate it. And the natives, Native Americans, I think they have a saying that says, like, every man has two wolves in him. And whichever wolf you feed is the one that controls you or dominates, right? cultivating whichever one you feed so i always say we've got a we've got an advocate in us and a critic and those like so imagine if the human body is the vehicle a car and there's two passengers in the car the advocate and the critic the critic's always whispering in your ear you can't you're an imposter you're a fake you're a phony they're going to figure you out sleep in no one's going to know it's okay right and the and the critic, normally we have the critics riding shotgun with us as we're driving the car. And then we have the advocate in the trunk, duct taped, bound, and you just hear some mumbling of like, you're a winner, I believe in you, right? But you're like, I think I hear something yeah. from the trunk, but I'm not sure. Our job as humans, yeah. like self-development, people go, what is self-development? I go, self-development, I'll make it real simple. It is to meta metaphorically take the critic, duct tape him, gag him, put him in the trunk, and then take the advocate, ungag him, unbound him, Put him in the front seat so you could hear him more often. And then he will help change your character through habitual, small habitual changes, habit changes. And they go, why can't I just get rid of my car my, my critic? You can't. I don't think our creator mm -mm. wants it that way. Because then you'd be That's perfect. That's the joke. You'd be perfect. That's the joke. Yeah. We're, not, we're supposed to be imperfect on this planet. Yep. The critic, it says that. Mm -hmm. The critic must be in the trunk so that we have that duality, the constant battle. And then go, no, no, no. The advocate is who I listen to every morning. Yeah. Every minute. Like, I could leave here and go, I'm, I'm going to eat a Whopper or I'm going to go work out. You wouldn't know the difference. I would. Character would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, because it's the same one that talks to you afterwards. You're like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not really, that's not the negative. It's your positive kind of getting on to you about it. Mm -hmm. That can happen too. Yeah, exactly. And you wake up in the morning, you got one day. That's it. Just make it's, the best of that one make, day. Make it the best you, the best you can. Mm-hmm. So tell us about your your mentor program that you started. Yeah, yeah. So um, th th this kind of goes back. So we're going to take a little trip back to Armenia. Um, as if all the fighting off gangs when we came here to the United States, getting bullied, having the lunch pass. God, if, if you had the lunch pass in elementary school, like you were a loser, right? And so I had a lunch pass because uh, our family was broke. Um, and... If all that wasn't enough, in Armenia, between the ages of four and six, before we escaped, I was molested over and over again by two older boys. And it's just been the last 10 years that I can talk about this. I'm 49 now. At 38, I had a massive panic attack. 
and that led me to the doctor. The doctor put me on Xanax. I didn't like Xanax. Four days into taking Xanax, I'm like, I need to get off this shit. Like, it kills all my creativity and my drive and my desire to work. What's my alternative, doc? Like, give me another medicine. He's like, there is everything else is going to make you feel numb like this. Have you tried talk therapy? I'm like, talk therapy is for broken people. Like, he goes, well, talk therapy can help you deal with your anxiety and your work stress. Like, a good therapist can give you tools to cope with that. So I go see and meet this guy, Kevin. And because I'm type A, tightly wound, I'm like, how many sessions is it going to take for you to give me the tools I need to overcome this anxiety? <laughs> when will I be done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When will you fix me, right? <laughs> yeah. And he goes, I don't know, three, four sessions, right? Like, the guy's like, just fucking leave me alone. Like, I'm going to do my job. And so, true enough, by the fourth session, like, he gave me all these tools, like, action alleviates anxiety, right? So don't dwell on something, take action on it. And then anxiety is anticipation of future pain. If you're anxious about something, you're anticipating something going wrong that may not even go wrong. We just fabricate stuff in our heads. And then he said, control your HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. HALT is an acronym. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. When you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and you're an addict, you're more likely to go back to your the things that you were addicted to. And so control those, manage those. Get your sleep, get your rest, you know, eat your food, n nourish yourself. Uh, don't, don't be lonely, surround your, we're tribal, duh. Because I would just crack my laptop open and start working. So I'm trying to build a company. And I'm, I'm in massive debt at the time, right? At, at 38 years old, like refinanced my house twice. Credit cards are maxed out. And long story short, Kevin gives me these tools. Fourth session, I'm signing the credit card slip, ready to leave. And he goes, hey, Bedros, before you leave, um, all we did is talk about your anxiety and your work stress. Like, is there any other life stresses, anything in life that's bothering you? I was like, no, man, I'm good to go. I got a, I got a business to build. And he goes, what about your parents? He goes, everybody's parents screwed them up in some way. I'm like, oh, my parents were fine. You know, we came to America. My dad, being a former communist, was pretty heavy-handed. He beat me and stuff, but it was better than being put on restriction like all my American friends. I never understood. I remember knocking on this one guy's apartment door, Scott. I'm like, Scott, can you come out and play? I'm like, G.I. Joe's. He's like, no, man, I'm on a two-week restriction. I was like, what is a restriction? He goes, I can't watch TV. I can't come out and play. I got in trouble. I was like, can't your mom or dad slap you around a few times and then you're good? I remember thinking like I had it better than him. My dad would just give me a beating until my mom would throw herself between me and my dad. And then my dad would calm down. And then I'm good. I'm good. Then I can go, go and play. But all my American friends had were put on restriction for two weeks. Like what torture that grounded. is. Grounded. Yeah, grounded. Yeah, right? I was always grounded. Yeah, I got, I got whipped. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I preferred... The physical over the grounding. Anyway, so so I'm telling Kevin that, and he's just laughing, shaking his head. I go, plus, what happened to me as a kid in Armenia was worse than the beatings my dad gave me. In four weeks, that man built such rapport with me that I just threw that nugget out. Now, keep in mind, I hadn't told anybody this in my life. No one, no one. I carried the weight of this molestation. And he goes, what happened? And I'm standing at his doorway in a room no bigger than this, and I just break down crying. It's the second floor of his office, two-story building, second floor. Out of that window, I could see my my truck. If I go backwards, is the staircase. I just want to leave now, but I'm crying. I don't want to talk about this. And he's like, Bedros, I'm so sorry. Like, is like, did something happen? I shake my head, yes. Now, no words are coming out. I'm looking at my truck, thinking that since I can't move my legs, if I could just fling myself across that his room and oh smash gosh. the window, I could get to my like my. The animal brain is just like, get to truck, right? Staircase is too difficult. Dive out window. Fling yourself through the glass, right? Buying a home these days, it can be pretty overwhelming, right? But Navy Federal Credit Union is here to help with their new home buying center. From start to finish, they've got you covered. You can get verified pre-approval showing sellers that you're actually serious. And with Reality Plus, you're connected to an agent who's with you every single step of the way. Lock in your interest rate for up to 60 days with their lock and shop. And if rates drop after you buy, the no refi rate drop option lets you lower your rate without having to refinance. So if the housing market has you stressed out, like it does a lot of people, Check out Navy Federal's Home Buying Center for solutions every step of the way. You can learn more about this at NavyFederal.org. Navy Federal Credit Union, our members are the mission. Navy Federal is insured by the NCUA.
And he goes, did something happen? Happen like you know, like were you were you abused? And I nod my head, yes. He goes, was it you know, were you raped? Nod my head, no. Were you molested? Nod my head, yes. By a babysitter, no. And then I had the words came out like by two older boys, Kevin. He's like, oh, Pedro, I'm so sorry. I'm just like snot and crying. I'm like, what in the hell, man? Like, I'm signing the credit card slip. This was it. You gave me the solution to what I needed. So he goes, go in and sit down. And I sit down and, and he goes, can you tell me uh, what happened? And I said, you know, whatever. I was molested by two older boys, Kevin. But I go, plus, what happened to that little boy I've dealt with? He goes, can you say what happened to me? I'm healed. And I start crying again. So he stops me. He goes, when you say what happened to that little boy, that's called disassociation. Disassociation is the first step into creating multiple personalities. I was like, holy hell. Like, I'm an entrepreneur, so I don't know the psychological world. And now he tells me, like, all I'm thinking is multiple personality disorder, that movie from M. Night Shyamalan, right? Like, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> so I'm like, what's the solution, Kevin? What do we do? He's like, let's just do a couple more sessions. 15 months later, I, I heal through that. And I realized that what happened to me, the shame, the rage, the confusion, shame, like, man, Melanie and Marcus can't find out about this. Like, they'll think I'm gross. They'll think I'm some animal. They, they'll, they'll, they'll think less of me. Confusion. Am I gay or something? Did I do something to invite those two older boys to do that to me? And then rage. Like, why didn't anyone protect me? Like, this happened in a carport in Armenia over and over again. In Armenia, we have babushkas, the grandmas. In Russian, babushka means grandma. Those grandmas, man, they're like the Gestapo. They police everybody. They police other people's kids. They would make us wash our hands before we eat and pull us by our ear if we didn't. It's like, man, they would do that, but they wouldn't stop these little boys. And so I had this rage. Like, no one protected me as a little kid, right? And so... I'm talking through this over 15 months with Kevin and basically the example he gave he goes dude you've got this rage in you like he goes when you start getting so like focused on telling me something he goes you notice I sit back in my chair I go yeah he goes you're intimidating he goes this rage I can see rage in your eyes he goes it's like a beach ball that you're always holding at waist level underwater but sooner or later you're gonna get tired and that beach ball is gonna pop up and that's your rage I'm like that shows up in my life and I just lose my cool, right? He goes, we're gonna work through that. So for those 15 months we did, and what was a, what he called a mountain on my timeline of life is just a speed bump on the timeline of my life. I did nothing to invite those boys to do that. There is no shame in this. Like one out of every four people have had some kind of sexual abuse. One out of every three have had some kind of physical, mental, emotional abuse. Um, and so the first time I talked about it was a year later at 39 and a half years old at an event. Uh, but I realized, like, I looked up to those boys as a rite of passage. Like, they were, I was four or five years old. They were 12, 13 years old. That's what young boys do, you know. And so they took advantage, as Kevin says, of a very beautiful thing. Like, their job was to mentor me, bring me into the fold with all the older boys and teach me what older boys do. Instead, they took advantage of that, of something so sacred. And this is why I, I created, so years later, I read a book when my son was born, I read, a, I was given a book um, by a, a friend of mine, another mentor, and the book was called Raising a Modern Day Knight. It talked about the responsibility we have as fathers to raise young knights, right? Modern day knights, chivalrous, compassionate, loving, but savage, servants, uh, courageous, etc. And I'm like, man, this is great. I need to do this. So I raised my son by that book. And, um, you know, gave him, and, and the book talks about when they're 12, 13, 14 years old, put him through a rite of passage experience because in all of history, for hundreds of years, the Aborigines took their boy, you know, boys 13 years old, dad and, and a few trusted friends take him to the edge of the forest as the sun is going down. They take a knife, they cut a little slit on him so he's bleeding, hand him the knife, go into the forest, don't come out until the sun comes up. Fend for yourself and the blood is going to draw other animals in. When he comes out next morning, when the sun comes out, the dads, the dad and all the men that he trusts of the tribe hug him and they go, son, now you've got a seat at the table. You're now a young man. We're going to forge you into the way of men, how men are, right? You're not a man. You now have a seat at the table to become a man. Like we don't have that. Like I was talking about earlier, you know, a young girl, she'll have a, she'll have a period. She'll sprout boobs. And it's a very physical thing that happens that you are now a woman. 
nothing happens like that for a young man. We might get a little bit of peach fuzz. We get horny. Uh, Smell. Uh, yeah, we stink. Exactly. <laughs> but nothing physical enough happens where it goes, you're a man. And so there was always a rite of passage, which is why squires and knights exist. The knight's job was to tend to the squire and teach him how to be a, a, a capable, courageous, confident young man. And the young man's job as a squire was to wash the horse and clean the armor and sword fight with him and learn the way of chivalry. And so all of that has stopped, which is why these young men are so lost today. And dads don't know how to lead their men. They're, so 57% divorce rate. Half the dads are not even in the home. So already these young men are lost. And of the other half that are there, most are emotionally disconnected from their young men. And so these young men don't, real, don't know what their identity is, don't know what their role is. I, I've got this rage and anger in me. Am I supposed to be rough and tumble? They say I can't because that's bullying. Yeah, you're supposed to be rough and tumble, but also know how to control it. As, as, um, oh, there's a difference. Right, of course. Jordan Peterson Every guy knows about. that, too. Yeah. Every, Any guy tells you he doesn't is full of shit, man. We instinctively know it, but we haven't been taught how to control those emotions. And that's, that's the thing. And that's why we're supposed to be around each other. Mm-hmm. That's right, because yeah. when there's, there's bullies and there's the bull. Yes. Bulls, when they walk in, yeah. just, just, everyone's You cool. know who they are. And I, there are adult men walking around, but it's still boys in there. Yeah. You can tell by the look on their face. Yeah. And all the men know that when they yeah. walk in the door. Yep. You can tell an adult who's never, an adult male who's never been tested. Never been tested, never been challenged, never been told that he's immediately. Got what it takes. Yeah. We pick that up instinctually mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're approval seeking, validation seeking, they can't make eye contact, their handshake tells you a lot about who they are. Oh, that's the first thing. Yeah. I teach that to random kids. Yeah. <laughs> he does. At the church hey boy, house, bro. I work the door, front door <laughs> at the church. When they walk in, they slap me that freaking Lint slack fish. grip. <laughs> we call what? Uh, hey, whoa, back up, partner. Let me teach you something. Yeah. I'll do it right in front of their dad. Yeah. I don't even care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. The dad was never taught, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the unfortunate thing. And so we created the Squire program where dads and sons can come out together. Sons have to be 13 to 16 years old. And for 12 hours, we put them through physical challenges, hardships. And at the end of the day, the dad, like ice baths, truck pulls, like, like think like tiny, tiny, mini, mini, micro little hell week yeah. at, for, for fathers and sons. Like nothing, obviously, but it, definitely tough and challenging, right? Sure, they have to work as a team. And the, at the end of the day, at hour number 11 of the 12 hours, the boys are blindfolded by the dads. There's like bear traps, bundled up razor wire, two by fours with rusty nails sticking up because the book, Raising a Modern Day Night, talked about taking your son through an obstacle course, just using your voice. And, and he has to, if he trusts his dad's voice enough, all right, son, take two steps forward. Okay, now 90 degrees to the left. Okay, big step, you're stepping over some rusty nails. Okay, boom, you did it, son, right? And the whole idea is you trust your dad's voice right now who's guiding you. Later, you'll develop the voice in your gut, your radiance, your higher self. Through enough life experiences, you'll know right and wrong, and you'll guide yourself through yeah, life. That happens. And the noise of life won't distract you, right? And that's what being a, 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 a dad, a mentor is. And so that's what the Squire program is. But what the dads don't realize is about seven hours into the program, I have one of my instructors, uh, you, know, you know Ray, Ray Cash Care. Yeah. Uh, we know him well. Everybody okay. knows Ray. So Ray is one of our instructors. Oh, nice. So Ray, the Navy SEAL, and Steve Eckhart, the Marine, will carve the sons out and take them for two hours through some fun exercises and obstacle courses while me and the dads start having like these conversations of like, hey, what's stressing you out? Why aren't you showing up for your family? Like, what's, what's, what's on your mind? How do you become the congruent man that your son's looking for? And so the son, dads always leave going, I thought this was for my son. Turns out this was as much for me as my son. So that's my, the passion project. I, I, turns out I built all these companies so that I could fund this one thing, Squire program that we do. And now we have it in four different states. So yeah. it's a physical location they're going to? Y yes, ma'am. Is it like a camp where it's just every once in a while? Yeah, it happens in most states that it's in. So in Texas, it's out here in Houston. Okay. Uh, run by a dear friend of mine named Darnell. Um, he's a firefighter. And he and his son run it. He and his son went through the Squire program. And then they started the Squire program out here. I run it in Southern California. Nick Kumalastos, a former Marine uh, re re recon guy, uh, Raider, Raider, uh, runs it in North Carolina. Um, Matt Ortiz, an MMA fighter, went through it with his son. He runs it in Chicago, Illinois. And our fifth one now in Denver is about to open up. And they're just, I license out what I do. So do you have advanced camps? 
advanced ones after that. Yeah, so no, you go sir. through the one, you know, so you got this knight, they got yeah. the squire. Yeah, I suppose we need something more. Eventually, because yeah. the squires will have to become a knight, there'll have to be a rite of passage for that. Right. You right. know how this works. If we're yeah. if you're reaching that far back, if you're yeah. going that far back to yeah. bring that that yeah. type of man back, yeah. then there are levels for sure. Marcus yeah. is like, make it. Look I know exactly what he's talking about, man. <laughs> I, I can see that in my head right now, what you're okay. talking about. Maybe maybe I'll tap on you to help us create. And those names you've been answer. throwing down, There's a look, there's a bunch of knights. Yeah, and then there's a bunch of seals. They're different too. Yeah. Maybe you and, and there's different. They've got saints out there. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. my but, brother, my brother, my uh, my brother, my youngest wants to be a fireman now. He told me okay. that the other day. Yeah. I was real proud when he said he wanted to throw on uniform. What did we say he was going to do? And he goes, "No, I'm going to be a fireman." Oh. <laughs> He loves video games. Okay. I mean, which Hunter never liked video games. So I was that was not something that I was used to. And well, the two of you had a video game. Wait a second played now. Together. Hold on. Yeah. Y'all played a video game together, but Hunter was never just in a room by himself playing video games. Axe is. He loves his video game time and he's really good at it. But it drives us crazy because mm. we're not used to that personality so i saw i'm like why not embrace it and i signed him up for this camp that's like one or two days a few hours a day in houston that is like a it's like a youtuber camp and i thought because he wants to stream i said okay. you can you can at least embrace it and right. try it out he got so mad at me for signing up and he goes i don't want to be a content creator i want to be a fireman and i'm like Okay, cool. All right, we won't do this. <laughs> How cool is that, man? So He's not a, yeah. He doesn't go in there to play the game. He goes in there to play with his friends. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, uh, look where I stuck him. Uh, right. Know, nowhere. So, right. I mean, there right. are. Yeah. He can't there. very well go next door. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I throw him out of there a piece of cake, but he, you know, you know it, it just ended became, up working out it. for the best. That's funny. Right. I don't want to be a content creator. Yeah. I'm just playing video games and hang out with my friends. My, I want to be a firefighter. Yeah. Be a firefighter. So I'm he, thinking, that. how did that make you feel when he said that? Really good. Right? I mean, I was trying to get on his level because I've been so negative about it lately like yeah. get out of your get out of the room and do this and do that and yeah. he got it he I just had turned it all wrong. he just turned 13 so I got him something I got him all his power tools and all his equipment and his life yeah, so he came yeah, with it yeah. one of the things is he has to, as soon as the sun goes down he's got to walk from the driveway to the front gate and back it's two and a half miles in the there dark you go. there you go no blade see that's the rite of passage no blade. yeah what I have that does. we've got power tools yeah, you're teaching him how to use all that right. that's that's our role as dads, not to just provide. Mm -hmm. So I started to write it down. Yeah. I'm the me. I teach Miyagi way. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Cobra Kai dude. I'm a, I'm a total Miyagi teacher, and uh, I I've really started getting into it. Are you gonna set up any booby traps when he does the walk? They're already out here. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, I mean, for him, not, 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 not for someone obviously who's gonna you know. <laughs> oh no, just for, for my son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, the the reason the fathers put the pressure on is because they can take it off. And yeah, yeah. let me tell you something: you get the father qual, you're allowed to put pressure on. Mm -hmm. You're, you're supposed to. That's a right that That's we gained Anything fathers. molded yeah. into anything we want here in this country has to have some pressure on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's just the way it works. Yeah. Well, I love that you're doing that because it really is needed today. There's, I think we, we were talking earlier about the transition of decades and everything. And our generation comes from divorced parents. I mean, a yeah. lot of us uh -huh. are, I am from a divorced Just parent. say everyone, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean yeah. if you're Gen X, I think everyone of us. people yeah. in our generation are from divorced parents. And even though I, I had it opposite, my dad raised me and I would go visit my mom on weekends yeah. where most people didn't see their dad unless it was a holiday or a special weekend or whatever. And they, a lot of boys too, and they are missing that. They're missing that like connection and drive and responsibility that dads teach. Yeah. And I remember once hearing uh, a quote that said, if we can teach our young men, then we don't have to fix our older men, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's so powerful. Like we don't have to try and take grown men and try and heal them and fix them if they can learn. Like my son just knows, he knows combatives, he knows how to be respectful and open doors and be chivalrous and please thank you, eye contact, stand up when you're shaking hands. Like it wasn't rocket science. I mean, that book helped me a lot in teaching him that because I didn't know those things. And so, but I knew like there's things I don't know, I better read this book and apply it to my son. And you know, he knows how to change a tire. He knows how to 
turn a wrench and those things are important not because he's going to go down that field in terms of vocation but because that's there's just certain things that men need to know because when there's a loud bang when there's a thud it is men that we look to 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 do what what men are supposed to do and i think that's important and there's a whole generation that doesn't know how to do what men are supposed to do Mm -hmm. what's how you identify them too yeah that's immediately t- how, how our people can identify them. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. You ever seen a well-trained dog walk in the room? When that sucker sits down, his legs are in them, ears are pointed forward, and I mean, that sucker is locked on. Yeah. You ever seen a human do that? I mean, when our military walks in or when there's an adult walks in that freaking door or a young man walks in that door and you know he's had something, train him. You can see it. Yeah. And yeah. every parent I've ever talked to tells me, would you please train my kid to do that? How did you, how'd you, it doesn't taste, it's not hard. It's, there's only a few things you got to actually do, and the rest of them take take over. Mm-hmm. It's just you just got to have guys like us to remind them, and it's not yelling at them or anything like that. You ever hear your like we say it all the time? Hey, you always know, said the same damn thing over and over again. Like our parents hated each other. Like the baby boomers, they they had it rough. Their war messed them up, dude. Yep. So you had the hippies and the patriots, and then then you had all the parents got divorced. Yep. And then this, here we are. Yeah. Then they put us all the wars, everything else messed us up. It's America. We made it. So in order to fix ourselves, you got to turn around and teach your kid. That, that's the, the tool you need that's is that it. kid. Yeah. And it's healing for us. It's healing. It. That's what I'm talking about. In it's order like for us to heal, we have to pay it forward to our kids. Because in the process yeah, of teaching, it's the best. we learn. It's the right? best. Yeah. And there's something. Let me tell you something. First time I looked at my kid, he well did said, something man. I said. Yeah. And it lo- he did it better than me. And I could tell he put some work into it. There's, there's a feeling that came over me I never forgot. Like It, it physically changed me. <laughs> I didn't want to go back to what I was. When I saw that moment, and I was like, hey, man, can I get that feeling again? Let me try this again. Yeah. Good. And I would search for something yeah, to yeah, put yeah. him in to see if that worked. And I started seeing a pattern. So I started looking for that. And not only that, if you help some kid that's not yours and watch them do that, it's even better. Nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah. It's even better. And you can't even believe it. Because they're not supposed to listen to us. <laughs> right. That, that's true. They're not supposed to listen to us yeah. by design. I mean, humans by design, they're just kind of like, you know, don't talk to anybody. Yeah. Psh- you, you know, it's, it's it's funny you say that because when I created the Squire program, it was something that I wanted to do because I put my son through it, his his life, and I was like, okay, I think I think we need we need this in our country. Um, and I, I've never served in the military. I in 1993, 1992, Mrs. Boyer slammed me against the wall, and she had every right to. I was being an absolute jerk in her class, and she goes, "You need to go into the military. They're the only ones who can set you straight." And each time she's slamming me. So 1993 comes, I finish high school. Dave, the guy who, the center, he and I go into the Marine Corps recruiting station and uh, they accept him. They don't accept me. Young man, you got flat feet. I'm like, what do I sign? Just take me. Mrs. Boyer says, you guys are the only ones that can set me straight. And I appreciated the fact that she set me straight like she was hit, slamming me against the wall. Uh, and I think I do need like brutal kind of physical uh uh, teaching sometimes I'm I'm very hard headed, and so I appreciated that. And they're like, "Sorry, man, we're not taking you." Right? Okay, fair enough. So that's when I decided to find another path in life, personal training. But um, like, like to me, I also realized as I'm creating the Squire program that I'm doing this for fathers and sons. But then these moms started to send me messages on social media, like the father's out of his life; he won't bring him. I said, "Well, is there a grandpa? Is there a?" An uncle uncle that can bring him? No, there isn't. I was like, shoot. So here's how crazy this is, man. Um, Throughout my career as an entrepreneur, when dudes come out of, especially like special operations, a lot of you guys head towards entrepreneurship because you guys just, most of you cannot go and just find a regular job. Like you're just meant to do like the higher level stuff in the civilian world and you do. And so through friends of friends, like, hey, Bedros, you know, this, this SEAL is, is looking for some skills on entrepreneurship. Will you work with him? Sure, I'll teach him. So one SEAL tells another, before you know it, tells the Marine uh, recon guy or, or Raider guy, then the Army Ranger guy, and then before you know it, like all these like special operations guys are, I'm helping them in their businesses. And then when these moms are reaching out to me, I'm like, you know what? There's no dad, there's no uncle, there's no grandpa. I got you. Hey, Sean Rogers, listen, will you do this for me? Yeah, man, of course. And so they step in as surrogate dads, right? yeah, which Very is so cool. awesome. Yeah, that, serves that dogs program. and serves dads. <laughs> Service dads, bro. Like you're getting a sign when you get out because I'm trying to get, keep my guys from killing themselves. Yeah. 
So I was coming at them from your, the, the, your, your swim buddy perspective. Like the minute you check out, yeah. out of there, you you got to check on somebody. Every yeah. Sunday, you got to get – not necessarily eyes. Well, we can do that now with those community – our right. phones, man. You right. can get eyes on anybody. Yep, yep. But like if you're one to be a service dad. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. So how can people find – like sign up for this or find where it is and uh, – The best daytime? place to go is squireprogram.com. Or just look up Squire program on the old Instagrams and YouTube, and they'll they'll find it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, is it expensive? It's nineteen hundred dollars. Okay. For the experience for fathers and sons, we kit them out with the backpack and all the cool stuff in it. Right, it comes. With, okay, check yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah. And it's a one day event. Out. Yeah, it's a one day event. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a really awesome experience. And and what's cool is we coach the dads. We give them like a handbook, like, hey, dad, by the way, here's. 36 other things you need to now teach your son as you guys leave here. So now the dad's stuck in research mode. They've got homework. Healing himself. Yeah. He has to learn mm -hmm. to then download to the son. God, you get to get a place where there's like in the forest. That's like what when, I was just thinking. When you, when, you're, when you turn the sage, get, get in the car or the bus, whatever, and drive to this place, yep. it'll be a sign that says, start here. Start here. <laughs> And then That'd you just walk them through it. That's poetic. You know what I mean? It doesn't cost anything. You just got to show your yeah. ass up. That's it. It shouldn't cost anything. Like, I bet if enough of us get together, we guys, because our buddy's got money now. Yeah. That yeah. was the one. I think that might be the one cool thing we got out of our life was that we, we got that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. like, when we go turn back around, I think a lot of the pros, basketball players, football players, they just need to go back to the hometown and be some coaches. Simple as that, man. Think how the world would change if every single one of them decided, I'm not just going to raise my kids, but I'm going to raise yeah. the tribe of kids. Who is your high school football coach? You're not going to believe it. Right. Right. That kind of thing. Yeah. We have that in Houston. Uh, a lot of the former ba like big Astros baseball players that were uh, like in uh, 2005, we went to the World Series, I think. Um, those players are now high school coaches at some of the high schools in Houston. It's really cool. That's cool. That's yeah. so Texas good. is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Texas is awesome. Is it true? I, I heard this and I want to confirm this with you. Is it true that the most SEALs come from Texas? I might be amenable and debatable because Montana spits out a Oh, bunch. does it? Okay. I don't know where I heard that. But because that. we're bigger, I per I would Head think. count probably be us. Yeah. Gotcha. Iowa spins out a lot of them too, man. I'm a cornfed boys are tough. Yeah, uh, Midwest. There's a lot of like Iowa, the Midwest Illinois, boys, Ohio. They're used to cold. They're tough. Yeah. They're reliable. Their whole life is. Yeah, man. Training. Maybe that's just training. Yeah. Their whole life. Yeah. If, you, if someone tells you they're yeah. from there, especially if they wrestled in their life, if they like, had the yeah. cauliflower yeah. ear yeah, 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 before yeah. they did, yeah. right? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Right <laughs> to the Navy. Off you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got a place for you, man. Yeah. yeah. But the Texans spot each other. Yeah, and yeah. they um, they lock on to each other when they're in buds or in okay. certain phases. They'll... Competitively or or no, no like, like brotherly, like brotherly. brotherly. Okay. It's like yeah. a little gang. Gotcha. Yeah. Gang within a gang. Gang within a gang. You, like within a gang. As soon as you spot them, you and Chris Kyle, and yeah. uh, he was what in STT while you yeah. were in even overseas phase one. Okay. Like I'd show yeah. up in Afghanistan somewhere, Iraq, out in the middle of nowhere, and it'd be a little fob, and there'd be a Texas flag hanging right under the oh, American yeah. flag, and be like. Ch -ch -ch. Marcus wore his Texas flag on his uniform. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Represent man. Texas, man. We're a you know, bunch. As I was driving here, I was just saying, like, because I'm from California. And, I love, and you spent time in California. I love the place. Arguably, if you take politics aside, I think it's probably one of the greatest states in terms of geography. Like, you've got mountains. You've got hills. You've got the ocean. you got you got all this, right? Rivers. you got all the central coast. and But then the politics screwed up. So take the politics away. But... There is no patriotism in California. Here, I'm driving down the highway from my hotel to here, a 45 minute drive, just Texas flags and US flags everywhere. And I love that. Like, as an immigrant, as a foreigner, like, you my dad it. risked his life to come here. I, I believe, like, I'm one of the biggest patriots, like myself, Elon Musk. Like, sometimes you'll see the immigrants that are some of the biggest patriots because they, they seen, are the biggest patriots. Yeah. You've seen Especially if they a, earned a different it. life. Yeah. If they've got that, if they roll in there and went the, do, done it the, the right way. Yeah. This is their place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what my dad says. He goes, we entered legally. He goes, every single person crossing that border should enter legally. And he goes, you say that on your shows. I go, okay, I will say that on my shows. That he's implying the podcast. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's yeah. That's true. It's yeah. y'all's and but everyone, who, everyone who served. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you serve, and if you, if you, if, you, if your blood's spilt on the ground or your flesh has hit it, it's yours. Oof. Yeah. Everybody remember? else is just a, uh, there's civilians and there's citizens. Yeah. Do you remember when you got your citizenship? Oh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. So my, mine was a little funny because both your mom and if you're a minor under 18, both mom and dad have to become citizen for you to become a citizen. Mm. Well, my mom, my brother, my sister all became a citizen when I was 
16. My dad took the citizenship test. They failed him. He took it again. They failed him. Now I'm rooting for my dad. Come on, dad. Like <laughs> Mom's got the test. You get, you get it. And I'm a yeah, citizen, yeah. right? They kept failing him. And they kept failing him because why were you a member of the Communist Party? And he's like, yeah. look, I had no choice, right? No, you had a choice. They asked you. And you said, yes. Yes, I did say yes. But if I said no, I'd be shipped off to Siberia, never to see my family. So on the fourth time, they made him a citizen. But by then, I had already become a citizen because I turned 18, took the test. Mm. and got naturalized. They grew into it. Yeah, dude. And, and a few years ago, uh, 2021, I was reading that citizenship, my, my certificate, and I wish my kids, Andrew and Chloe, and every young man and woman that was born here has a certificate like that that says that I will defend the Constitution against yeah, there should be enemies, something. foreign and domestic. You know, like it says that. And I was like, yes, sir, I will do that. Had my little flag and waved it during the during the swearing in ceremony. And it was something so valuable and meaningful to me, man, because mm -hmm. like I'm a part of like the cloth of of, of this country now. We you should know? have something like there what should a be gift. an American certificate. Yes. That every American My kids if, don't know if that. You are an actual American. When you walk into their house, I mean, you should know exactly what it is. Yeah. Framed on the freaking wall. Yeah. That means this place belongs to you if you need to, that kind of thing. Yeah. I saw you. That's a good idea. Because they don't teach us that in school that we're supposed to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. No. And you can see if they would. The only time you're supposed to stand up and be recognized that you'll, you'll throw down for this place is when we say the pledge. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But That's what that means. So, <laughs> like, yep. they make it to where it's just so rep like repetition that yeah. they don't really know the purpose of it. Right. Right. I just say this thing, and, yeah. and now you can opt out of it. Yeah, which is probably not here in Texas, but no. parts of California. Yeah. The reason things, you say you know, that is so guys it. like me and the guys I run around with will know that if, if look, if push comes to shove, you'll stand up and help. Mm -hmm. yep. Look, I, there, there are servants, people that are born into service. That, well, that's, we can't help ourselves. There are people who, you know, they're on the other side. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. love they love to get served. Yep. Yeah. Takers. S takers. Sometimes, yeah. you know, one, one side gets out of whack and things get thrown off. Man, that's what we got to do. Try to keep the yes, sir. You know, wings level, man. Yes, sir. But, but I think, I think it, it, there is a universal balance and it will come back to normal. I know things got crazy and off the, the rails after 2020, but... I don't know. I'm a forever optimist, and I do believe that good always wins. I because I think it might have been the end of our crazy time. So we started in 2001, and we ended in 2021, right? Yeah. Oh, look at that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Because yeah. you could feel the sh something shifted, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You kind of just here recently. Yeah. He's kind of feeling that. Yep. Yep. I'm just throwing that out there. This is the way I was yeah. kind of looking at it. So if you're going to really hammer the hell out of one generation, 20 years is a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. And they hit us in every angle. Yeah. From wars to getting sick to taking our houses away, taking our money away, we got ground to our rooms. Because yeah. that's the most formidable generation. We are the most formidable generation. I got to just be nice now. Yeah. Like a lot, I, I never noticed it until I started looking around. I was like, who the hell is causing all these problems? Like it might have been my generation. We didn't have a choice though. Right. right. <laughs> well, when I say we are the, we are currently the most formidable generation. Yeah. I think the boomers were by far. The most formidable generation. Wait till these suckers come up. Yeah, because it's yeah. a new time. The, yeah. the the tech age. Yep. You know we're not. We're still a little bit of the 1900s, the yep. ancients. Yep. <laughs> Somebody called us the ancients the other day. Yeah, yeah, the age. Bro, I still don't know how to order food on my phone. I, I don't uh, do that either. Yeah. No, I, I, just, I do it for him. So you know the boom. I'll be out of town. Yeah. I'll be out of town, and Marcus like, can you? Order yeah, me? Don't tell anybody that. <laughs> <laughs> Woman, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> <laughs> that's pillow talk, damn it. Yeah, yeah that, that happens. Okay, I'll call from a different state yeah. altogether. I'm like, can you... Uh... Hunter, delete that. <laughs> no, that's... Yeah, no, see, my son, my oldest has to run around with me now just to keep me in check. Yeah, that's Hunter funny. travels with him so he can make sure everything's... Uh, running, buddy. Yeah. Isn't that great? <laughs> Before they cancel dad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on yeah, bro, and sharing Thank, Thank you for the opportunity. You, yeah. guys, are, you guys are just God amazing. Man. Great that's job. Awesome. Thank you. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast. So buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> <laughs>